I remember talking to Michael later, and you know, he'd say to him, "Well, we're the toughest guys you ever had to play against." And he used to say, "Well, now Spreewell guards me as well as anybody." He was lightning quick. Coach used to put him in the game and says, "Just shut him down. Don't let him catch the ball. Don't let him touch the ball." And Spree was in people's jocks. He was the type of player who could take a coach's breath away. A raw talent who got a late start to basketball, Latrell Spreewell became one of the best wing players of his era off his relentless play on both ends of the court. He was one of the angriest dunkers the game has ever seen, could slash through any defense, and was an expert at acrobatic finishes. His shooting was streaky, but if he got hot, you were in trouble, especially in his later years. And then for as good as he was on offense, he took just as much pride on his defense, as one of the league's best two-way players. He started in Golden State, during a period of constant change and roster injury, which resulted in a lot of losing. But Spreewell was fully becoming a star, yet after his best career season, he was involved in the incident that is more associated with his career than anything else. He worked to regain respect and trust from the fans and coaches during his redemption stretch with the New York Knicks, even acting as the X-Factor on their 99 finals run. His career would end in Minnesota, but he would again be an X-Factor in what remains the best season in franchise history. Yet after 21 million wasn't enough to feed his family, his career was over after 13 seasons. Yet it's not fair that quotes like that and the choking incident is the only way people remember Spree, because his game was beautiful and raw at the same time, and most importantly, it was extremely effective. Let's jog your memory. A Wisconsin native, Latrell Spreewell moved to Flint, Michigan at the age of 7, soon after his parents had separated. He would stay there until the end of his sophomore year of high school before returning to Milwaukee with his mother. At this point, Spreewell had no experience playing organized basketball, but during his senior year, Washington High School head coach James Gordon noticed Spreewell in the halls and told him to come to tryouts, as Spreewell would eventually make the team and average 28 points per game, helping lead the team to a 24-2 record and even winning an award for his good character and respect. But after getting such a late start on basketball, he wasn't on any major program's radar, so he would enroll at Three Rivers Junior College for his freshman season. While at Three Rivers, Spreewell would continue to polish his extremely raw game. His freshman season would be overshadowed by an arrest for shoplifting, but by his sophomore year, he was clearly improving, as he averaged 26.6 points and 9.2 rebounds while leading the team to the National Junior College Final Four. And after such a great season, Spreewell had D1 attention and would accept an offer to play for Alabama going into his 1991 junior season. Alabama had lost their top two players from 1990 to the NBA in David Benoit and Keith Askins, and on top of Spreewell, they would welcome freshman guard James Hollywood Robinson. The talent pool on the Crimson Tide was understandably much better, as they also had another great junior forward in Robert Ory. So Spreewell wouldn't come in as a star, as he initially came off the bench, before being made a starter about halfway through the year. His stats would be modest, yet he would shoot over 51% from the field, and he was really earning his stripes through being a great defender who could guard multiple positions, as Alabama would feature a versatile team defense, with Spreewell even finishing second on the team in blocks at nearly two per game. The Tide would start the year slow at 2-3, and three, but would improve to finish the season at 18-9, and nine, with the highlight of their regular season being a 5-point win over number 8 Kentucky. They would then win the SEC Championship by defeating Florida, Auburn, and then Tennessee in the final, which would get them an automatic bid to the NCAA tournament as a four seed. And Spreewell would impress in the tourney, as a first round win versus Murray State saw him put up 12 points, 9 rebounds, and 3 steals. Then in round 2, he would have 21 points, 6 rebounds, and 6 assists, in a defeat of Wake Forest, as their next test was top seeded Arkansas in the Sweet 16. Unfortunately, Alabama would be defeated easily, as Spreewell struggled. Although he had 10 points in 2 blocks, he also committed 6 turnovers, so his first D1 season ended with him averaging about 9 points, 5 rebounds, and 2 blocks per game. Spreewell took a big step forward in his 92 senior season. He would finish 2nd on the team in scoring and 1st in steals, as he, Ori, and Robinson formed one of the nation's best trios. Spreewell would shoot nearly 50% from the field and nearly 40% from deep, and would be voted 2nd team All-SEC, and although his block numbers dropped, it was more so due to playing a lot more on the perimeter, which also explains his improved steal numbers, as he would also see himself voted to the SEC All-Defensive Team. Additionally, he was a workhorse this season, averaging over 36 minutes per game. Alabama had a great start to the year, as halfway through the regular season they were 14-1, and 
which included a win over 13th ranked Arkansas. They would cool off a bit in the second half of the season as they went just 9 and 6 to finish the year at 23 and 7. Alabama wouldn't be able to capture their fourth straight SEC title as after defeating Florida and Arkansas, they would lose to Kentucky in the conference championship. But a 25 and 8 record was still enough for a tournament berth as a 5 seed. Sprewell would play a good first round as he would have a team high 23 points on 50% shooting in a 5 point win over Stanford, but he wouldn't be able to carry it over to their second round matchup with North Carolina. As he went ice cold, he would shoot just 2 of 15 from the field, including going 1 of 6 from deep, as he only managed 5 points with the entire Alabama team shooting just 29% from the field, which would lead to a loss, as their season was over. But Sprewell's senior year saw him average about 18 points, 5 rebounds, and 2 steals per game. So a soon-to-be 22-year-old Sprewell had only 5 years of organized basketball under his belt, but his incredible athleticism and two-way potential still made him an intriguing prospect going into the 1992 NBA draft. But another knock on him was his perceived maturity, as multiple GMs were planning to avoid him for that reason. This draft was headlined by future Hall of Fame big men like Shaquille O'Neal and Alonzo Mourning, and featured a lot of seemingly more polished wing players. But even though he wasn't a lottery pick, the Golden State Warriors would still take a risk by drafting Sprewell in the first round. The Golden State Warriors select Latrell Sprewell from the University of Alabama. So Sprewell had been chosen 24th overall as he was the 12th guard taken in the draft and would join a Warriors team featuring their star duo of Tim Hardaway and Chris Mullen. Realistically, the Warriors needed a big man, but they would instead take Sprewell as head coach Don Nelson likely was intrigued by Sprewell's endless motor and his potential in a fast-paced transition offense. And he may have also seen an opportunity to recreate the Warriors' run TMC offense from a couple years earlier, which he had broken up by trading Mitch Richmond to the Kings for Billy Owens. Sprewell would begin his career as a starter and ultimately would start 69 of the 77 games he played this season. Yet part of the reason why he started from day one was due to the Warriors being destroyed by injuries this year. Sarunas Marshallonis would miss the first month and a half of the season, Owens would only manage 37 games, and their star duo of Mullen and Hardaway would play 46 and 66 games respectively. So Sprewell would be one constant on a team that lacks stability. He would finish fourth on the team in scoring, while also finishing top 10 among rookies. Additionally, he would be top three in assists and steals among rookies as well as he would be named second team all-rookie. Overall, he would hit double figures in 61 games, which included a 36-point performance in an April 8th win over the Lakers. Additionally, he would record seven double-doubles. But even though the Warriors had a top three scoring offense, all their injuries, along with a bottom three scoring defense, was too much to overcome, as they would finish at 34 and 48 and miss the playoffs. With Sprewell's rookie season seeing him average about 15 and a half points, four assists, and one and a half steals per game. So the Warriors had the third pick in the 1993 NBA draft and would select Memphis guard Penny Hardaway. But then just minutes later, they had traded Hardaway along with three first round picks to the Magic for their first overall pick in Chris Webber. And while at the time, this was an exciting acquisition for Golden State, in a short period of time, it would become more of a regret for management and fans. The 94 Warriors looked primed to be an exciting team. They had young and versatile big men in Owens and Weber, a declining yet still effective Chris Mullen on one wing, and a second year Sprewell who was about to break through on the other wing. And they would all be led by all-star point guard Tim Hardaway. Uh oh. So the Warriors got some of the worst news they could ask for just weeks before the season began. Hardaway had torn his ACL during a Warriors practice and he wasn't the first Golden State guard to suffer a torn ACL this offseason, as Marshall Lonis had suffered his own about a month earlier. So while the Warriors had a great front line, they were going to lack depth this season. But it looked like they had a new duo in Sprewell and eventual Rookie of the Year Weber. They would be the team's top scorers, and Sprewell would also lead the team in steals, with his career-high 2.2 steals per game ranking in the NBA's top 10. And he rarely came off the floor, as his 43.1 minutes per game would lead the league. The Warriors maintained their fast pace and finished as the league's second ranked scoring offense, and Sprewell would be a large contributor to that, as he had raised his scoring by nearly 6 points per game. He would play and start in all 82 games, hitting double figures in 78 of them, and recording his first 40 point game on February 10th, when he had 41 points on nearly 67% shooting in a win over New York. And on the defensive end, he would have 39 games with at least 3 steals, as on top of being voted to his first career all-star game, 
He would also be named second team all defense and first team all NBA, while finishing second in most improved player voting. So even without Hardaway and Marshallonis, the Warriors were still winning and would end the year hot, winning eight of their last nine as ultimately they finished the regular season at 50 and 32, which would get them a first round matchup versus the defending Western Conference champion Phoenix Suns. And even though Golden State would get a vintage performance from Mullen, a legendary series from Charles Barkley would be too much as the Suns swept the Warriors in what was still a close series, with each game being decided by seven points or less. Sprewell wouldn't shoot great, but overall played a good series. Game one would see him put up a 22 point, 10 rebound double-double, yet he would shoot just seven of 20 from the field. Game two would see him record 19 points, five rebounds and seven assists, Yet again, he would shoot just 9 of 24 from the field. But Game 3 was his best, as he had 27 points on 10 of 16 shooting. Yet fouls would be an issue this series as well, as he would record 5 fouls in each game. So their postseason was over quickly, but Sprewell's regular season would see him average about 21 points, 5 rebounds, 4.5 assists, and 2 steals per game. But unfortunately for the Warriors, there was trouble in paradise. The conflict was mainly between Weber and Don Nelson. Reportedly, Weber was not a fan of Nelson for a few reasons, one being that he felt Nelson was trying to sabotage him by not letting him get too good too fast, which was reflected in him getting only 32 minutes per game, which he felt was very low for a player of his caliber. Then there was also the fact that Nelson would play him at center instead of his more natural power forward, which he didn't appreciate. Lastly, Weber felt that Nelson was unnecessarily hard on him, Nelson already had a reputation of really laying into his players, and Weber would acknowledge that a coach like that is fine, and that he's had coaches like that before. But with Nelson, he felt it got to the point of disrespect. And then Weber was reportedly also upset that shortly before the regular season, the Warriors made a trade to acquire Ronnie Cycli from Miami. But in doing so, they had sent Miami Billy Owens, who was one of Weber's friends. So Weber was sitting out to begin the season, and if it wasn't clear how unhappy Weber was, all of this would lead to him exercising a clause in his contract, allowing him to opt out of his 15-year, $74 million deal after one season. But he would eventually sign a new contract with Golden State on November 16th. However, this wasn't because their differences had been resolved. It was because it was setting things up for a sign-in trade, as the Warriors didn't want to lose Weber for nothing, almost immediately shipping him to Washington for Tom Gugliotta and a few first-round picks. But Gugliotta would only last 40 games in Golden State, before being traded to Minnesota for Danielle Marshall. So the Weber experiment had been a failure. But back to Sprewell. He was quite upset about this trade, as he would go as far as to boycott practice after Weber was shipped away. So team chemistry wasn't great to begin the 95 season. The common theme of Sprewell's time with the Warriors continued, as even though he was relatively healthy, playing and starting in 69 games, the rest of the core struggled to stay on the floor. Cycli would be limited to 36 games, as he struggled with knee issues. Mullen would also deal with a knee injury which limited him to 25 games, and although Hardaway returned to play 62 games and put up good numbers, his efficiency had taken a hit, yet he and Sprewell would still combine for over 40 points per game, as Sprewell would lead the team in scoring and steals, yet would also struggle to make shots, as he would shoot below 42% for the season. Nonetheless, he would hit double figures in 62 games, including 13 games with at least 30 and would also record a career-high 8 steals in a March 26th loss to Orlando, as he would earn his second straight All-Star selection. But the Warriors were struggling, as after 45 games they were sitting at 14-31. So during the All-Star break, Nelson stepped down as both head coach and GM, and assistant Bob Lanier would fill the vacant coaching position for the remainder of the season. But the Warriors were already a lost cause, as under Lanier they would go just 12-25, and, and a 26-56 and finish wouldn't be enough for a playoff berth as Sprewell's season ended with him averaging about 20.5 points, 4 assists, and 1.5 steals per game. The Warriors were able to secure the first overall pick in the 1995 draft and would use it to select another big man, as they would take Maryland's Joe Smith, who reportedly would quickly become Sprewell's best friend on the team. And they had a new coach in Rick Adelman. The once great duo of Mullen and Hardaway was now in the past, as although they were both still on the team to begin the season, Mullen appeared in just 55 games while starting only 19 of them, and Hardaway appeared in just 52 games while starting 18 of them. But Hardaway was unhappy with his new bench role, so at the trade deadline, the Warriors sent him to Miami, with their best returning piece being big man Kevin Willis. But the Warriors' two best players this season were Sprewell and Smith, as they would be the team's top two scorers. Yet Sprewell would put up his lowest scoring averages since his rookie year, while only shooting about 42%. 
but defensively he would still lead the team in steals and even finish top 10 in DPOY voting. Sprewell would still hit double figures in 67 games and would have 8 games with at least 30. But the Warriors had lost a lot of firepower, as after putting up at least 105 points per game in each of Sprewell's first three seasons, they would average less than 102 this season. And with a bottom 10 scoring defense, they wouldn't be able to get over 500, as although they improved, they still finished with a 36 and 46 record and again missed the playoffs, as Sprewell's season saw him average about 19 points, 5 rebounds, and 4 assists per game. But Sprewell would take his game to another level in 1997. The Warriors had signed veteran point guard Mark Price in the offseason, and he would give them solid production over 70 appearances this year. Additionally, Mullen would play his healthiest season in years, appearing in 79 games and starting 63 of them. Smith would have the best season of his career in year two, as he teamed up with another player having a career year in Sprewell. Sprewell would lead the team in scoring on a career high 24.2 points per game, which would be a top five mark in the league. He would also rank top 20 in assists behind a career high 6.3 per game, with his 1.7 steals per game leading the team. And he would shoot nearly 45% from the field, which would be the second highest mark of his career. As he would return to the All-Star game, he would hit double figures in 78 games and have six games with at least 40, including a then career high 46 points to go along with 10 assists and five steals in a January 21st win over Dallas. Additionally, he would record a career-high 13 rebounds to go along with 29 points in a November 1st loss to the Clippers, and would also dish a career-high 13 assists to go along with 19 points in an April 5th defeat of San Antonio. But the Warriors also no longer featured Cycli or Willis, and that lack of an interior presence hurt them on the defensive end, as they allowed the third most points in the league and would fail to score 100 points per game this season as this would lead to them finishing at just 32 and 50, once again missing the playoffs. As Sprewell's career year saw him average about 24 points, 4.5 rebounds, and 6.5 assists per game. The 98 season looked like it was going to be Sprewell's year. Mullen was gone, and the team also had a new coach. Moving on from Rick Adelman and bringing in PJ Carlissimo, the team had rebranded with Spree acting as the face of the franchise and he gave every indication that he was about to push into superstardom after dropping 45 points against Minnesota on opening night. However, the Warriors lost and continued to lose, as they started the season 0-9, and after 14 games they were 1-13. But then Sprewell's career and image changed forever during a December 1st practice. Seems losing your nerve. In the case of Latrell Sprewell, it meant losing your cool and your job for choking your coach, PJ Carlissimo. When you're 1-13, there's clearly going to be frustration and a lack of patience. And during this practice, Carlissimo had reportedly yelled at Sprewell to make better passes, with Brian Shaw in an appearance on Paul George's podcast saying instead that Sprewell was just shooting around and Carlissimo yelled at him that he needed to give him more. And Carlissimo was cut from the same cloth as Nelson, as a coach who would get in his player's face, which was something that Sprewell had not had to deal with over the past couple years, as Adelman was more of a coach who coddled yet had earned Sprewell's trust. And if Carlissimo had just yelled at Sprewell, then that probably would have been it. But he reportedly started walking towards him, with Sprewell telling him not to come up on him, as one warrior would even say that Carlissimo was the one that provoked the ensuing incident. As once Carlissimo got close enough, Sprewell lunged at him, choking him for about 15 seconds until teammates broke it up. As Shaw would say that the players let it go on for as long as it did, because they also didn't appreciate how Carlissimo talked to them. But it could have been done there, yet this is where Sprewell made a bad decision, as instead of just accepting that he was thrown out of practice, he reportedly returned about 15 minutes later and landed a punch on Carlissimo, before again being pulled away. Yet Sprewell would deny throwing this intentional punch in a 60 minutes interview. And interestingly, this wasn't the first time Sprewell found himself in a situation like this, as a couple years earlier, he had gotten into a fight with teammate Jerome Kersey, and after it was broken up, Sprewell would return with a 2x4, and also threaten to get a gun. But this also hadn't been the first time that Carlissimo had turned a player against him, as during his time as Portland's head coach, he feuded with Rod Strickland, to the point that Strickland refused to play for Carlissimo for 6 games. And Mark Price, who had been traded to Orlando right before the start of the regular season, had predicted about a month before his trade, that Carlissimo's no-nonsense attitude was going to lead to a confrontation. And Shaw also added that Carlissimo already had an issue with Sprewell for not adhering to the team dress code and wearing his hair in braids. So initially, the Warriors suspended Sprewell for 10 games. But the next day, they really upped the punishment 
by voiding the remainder of his contract. And then the NBA followed suit by suspending Sprewell for the remaining 68 games of the season, which was the longest non-drug related suspension in history at the time. And to add insult to injury, Converse also terminated his contract. But there was some speculation that Sprewell's harsh punishment was an attempt to make an example after multiple players had been involved in insubordinate or criminal acts in the past year. But Sprewell's 14 game 1998 season had seen him average about 21 and a half points, three and a half rebounds, and five assists per game. So Sprewell would spend the majority of the 98 season wondering what was going to happen with his career, as after all, he was just 27 at the time of the incident and had plenty of basketball left in him. Sprewell would even appear on 60 Minutes to discuss the incident, and he would explain that it wasn't as serious as it was made out to be. I wasn't choking PJ. I mean, PJ, he could breathe. It's not like he was losing air or anything like that. I mean, it wasn't a choke. I wasn't trying to uh, kill PJ. He would acknowledge that he should have been punished for what he did, but that the league shouldn't have punished him as harshly as they did. However, Sprewell would get his contract voiding overturned, as although his suspension was upheld, he remained under contract with Golden State. But Sprewell's suspension would last longer than expected, as the lockout occurred over the summer, leading to the season being postponed, as he would eventually be reinstated, but not until early January. And then less than a couple weeks later, the New York Knicks took a chance and sent a package of aging players to Golden State for the 28-year-old former All-Star. And luckily for New York, this would end up being a steal. Sprewell would join a Knicks team led by aging leader Patrick Ewing and other veterans like Allen Houston and Larry Johnson. Sprewell would begin the season as a starter, even scoring a game-high 24 in the Knicks season opener. But he would play just one more game, as a heel injury he had been dealing with since training camp would eventually be diagnosed as a stress fracture as he would miss the next month, and when he did return, he would come off the bench. Nonetheless, he would still hit double figures in 32 of the 37 games he played, as he would finish as the team's second leading scorer behind Ewing, and the Knicks' 27-23 and record would be enough to sneak them into the playoffs as the 8th seed. Sprewell would really prove himself as a difference maker that the Knicks needed throughout the postseason, as in their first round series with Miami, he would continue coming off the bench, but would be the team's leading scorer, while averaging over a steal per game as he would hit double figures in each game, including two games with at least 20. The series would go the distance, and although he would struggle in the series deciding Game 5 with 14 points on 6 of 16 shooting, a clutch Allen Houston runner would see the Knicks knock out the top-seeded Heat to advance. The second round would bring the Hawks, who the Knicks would make surprisingly quick work of in a four-game sweep, as Sprewell continued to come off the bench, but his 22.5 points per game would lead all players and he would do so on nearly 47% shooting, as he would start the series with back-to-back 31-point -back games, but would cool down the rest of the way, as he had 17 points in Game 3, and then just 11 in Game 4. Yet he would also pull down 5 rebounds in each game, as the Knicks' playoff run continued, with their next challenge being the Indiana Pacers in the Eastern Conference Finals. Sprewell continued coming off the bench to begin the series, as he would put up 16 points on just 6 of 16 shooting in a Game 1 win, then would come back with 15 points on 6 of 14 shooting in a Game 2 loss. But with the series tied 1-1, it was announced that Ewing's postseason was over due to an Achilles injury. So Game 3 would again see Sprewell come off the bench to put up 14 points in a win. But then going into Game 4, a lineup change was made, as Sprewell was finally made a starter. He would underwhelm in his first game as a starter, putting up just 12 points in a loss. But after this, he would find his footing. As without the offense going through Ewing, it allowed for more floor spacing and freedom on the offensive end for Sprewell, which let him play to his strengths of slashing to the hoop and scoring in transition. As in a Game 5 win, he would drop 29 points, and then he would help the Knicks close out the series in Game 6, with a 20-point performance, as New York had become the first 8 seed to make the NBA Finals. The Knicks would get San Antonio, and although Sprewell would shoot just 41% for the series, he would lead the Knicks by averaging 26 points while also pulling down nearly 7 rebounds and getting over a steal per game. He would have a slow start with just 19 points on 9 of 24 shooting in a Game 1 loss, but after that he would score at least 24 points in each remaining game of the series. He would put up 26 points and 7 rebounds in a Game 2 loss, then would have 24, 5, and 5 in a Game 3 win. Game 4 would see Sprewell drop 26 points, yet the Knicks would drop the game, as they fell behind 3-1 and were on the brink of elimination. Game 5 would be Sprewell's best, as he did everything he could to extend the series, dropping a game-high 35 points on about 48% shooting, while also pulling down 10 rebounds. But the Knicks would come up just short, as they lost by 1, 
ending their year. But Sprewell's redemption season would see him average about 16.5 points, 4 rebounds, and 2.5 assists per game. And this incredible postseason performance would help lead to Sprewell being rewarded going into the 2000 season. I know the Knicks look a lot like they did at the end of the season and may continue to for a while. The Trails Prewell has decided to sign the five-year, 61-plus million dollar deal the Knicks had offered. As a so on top of a new contract, Sprewell had a new position as he was officially shifted to small forward to continue playing opposite Allen Houston in the starting lineup in 2000. It was the beginning of a new era in New York as Ewing wouldn't be the team's leading scorer. Instead, it would be their smooth duo of Houston and Sprewell acting as the team's top two scorers, and Sprewell's 43.5% shooting would be his highest average since prior to the choking incident, and he would also finish second on the team in assists and tie for first in steals. Additionally, he would play and start in all 82 games for the first time since 1994. Overall, he would hit double figures in 76 games, including 8 games with at least 30 and 4 double-doubles. And although the Knicks center duo of Ewing and Marcus Camby would each miss at least 20 games, they would still put together a 50-win season, as they would finish at 50-32 and 32 and get a first-round matchup versus a young Toronto team, making their first playoff appearance in franchise history. However, New York's experience would prove the difference maker, as although the games were close, the Knicks would sweep the Raptors. Sprewell once again would play a great series, leading the team in scoring and shooting nearly 49% from the field, as he would have two games with over 20 points and would hit a dagger in Game 2. As after dropping 23 points, he would have the ball with less than 7 seconds left and the Knicks down by 1. Clear out. on Sprewell with uh, yep. 10 seconds to go on the shot clock. Sprewell with a fall away. He's got it! Sprewell would raise up and hit what ended up being the game winner as the Knicks closed it out a couple nights later, setting up another series with the Miami Heat. Sprewell would again lead the team in scoring, yet he would shoot below 38% from the field and 20% from deep but he would average nearly two steals per game and would still hit double figures in every game, including three games with at least 20. The series would go seven and the seventh game would come down to the wire, but New York would escape with a one point win as Sprewell would score a team high 24 points to clinch another trip to the conference finals. They would take on the Pacers for the second straight year. Once again, Sprewell led the team in scoring at nearly 20 a game, but it was up and down as he had two games with 32 points, but also had three games with 12 or less. But New York would again lose Ewing for part of the series, as with the Knicks already down 0-1, he would leave Game 2 early with a foot sprain, with the Knicks losing and falling behind 0-2. He would go on to miss their next two games, but the Knicks would even the series. And even though Ewing was back for Game 5, Indiana would take that game and the next one to eliminate New York. But Sprewell did what he could to again stave off elimination, as he had 32-5-5 in Game 6. But for his regular season, he would average about 18.5 points, 4.5 rebounds, and 4 assists per game. The Knicks had made a huge change in the offseason, as Ewing was gone, meaning Sprewell and Houston would lead the offense. And they would, as they were the team's top two scorers on slightly lower scoring averages, as the Knicks featured the second lowest scoring offense, but made up for it with the league's best scoring defense. And they had also acquired another veteran wing scorer from the Ewing trade in Glenn Rice. Additionally, right around the trade deadline, they would trade to acquire Mark Jackson, likely in hopes of maximizing the off-ball ability of both Sprewell and Houston. Sprewell would hit double figures in 72 games with one 30-point game, and even though the majority of his numbers had dropped from last year, he would still find himself competing in his fourth and final All-Star game of his career. And although they looked different without Ewing, the Knicks kept the same identity and rode their defense to a 48-34 season and a first-round rematch with Toronto. This time, Toronto would be ready. Sprewell would finish as the team's second leading scorer, but he really had trouble finding his shot, as he would barely shoot 40% from the field. Sprewell had a rough start, as he was averaging less than 10 points after the first two games, which the team split. But after that, he would have at least 20 points in the next three games, including a game-high 29 points on over 52% shooting in Game 5. Yet the Raptors would win by three, ending New York's season early, as Sprewell ended the year averaging about 17.5 points, 4.5 rebounds, and 3.5 assists per game. Going into 0-2, Sprewell and Houston were now both in their 30s, but it was hoped that they, along with Marcus Camby and a full season of Mark Jackson, would be able to lead the Knicks to yet another playoff appearance. But then injuries would limit Camby to just 29 games, 
which would affect New York's defense. Sprewell would finish second on the team in scoring behind his highest average since his Golden State days, but would do so on only about 40% shooting. Yet he would still finish second on the team in assists and tie for first in steals. But he was putting together some of his best individual scoring performances of his career. As in a December 11th loss to Boston, he would drop a career-high 49 points on over 56% shooting. Then about a month and a half later, he would drop 48 in a win versus Milwaukee and would have one more 40-point game in mid-March when he had 43 in a victory over Sacramento. But after a 10-9 start, head coach Jeff Van Gundy unexpectedly stepped down. Don Chaney would replace him, but New York struggled under Chaney, as they saw their season slip away, going 20-43 and with Chaney, and ultimately finishing at 30-52 and and missing the playoffs, as Sprewell's season saw him average about 19.5 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 4 assists per game. In another possible instance of making an example out of Sprewell, he would be fined a quarter of a million dollars after reporting to training camp with a broken hand. But the reason he was fined was because he had initially told the team he slipped on his yacht, but reports eventually came out saying that he actually broke it while fighting on his yacht. Sprewell would still play 74 games this year, but his scoring would be his lowest since his first season in New York, when he was coming off the bench. However, he would again be the team's second leading scorer and would hit double figures in 72 games. He would also record a triple-double in a February 28th victory over Orlando and would make history in a February 4th game versus the Clippers when he set an NBA record by going 9 for 9 from deep on his way to scoring a season-high 38 points. The Knicks were still coached by Chaney but would end with another losing season as their 37-45 record wouldn't be enough for a playoff berth and Sprewell's season saw him average about 16.5 points, 4 rebounds, and 4.5 and assists per game. But soon after the season, Sprewell would be shipped out of the city in which he had revived his career. Sprewell would be involved in a four-team trade, which saw him end up in Minnesota. The T-Wolves were trying to give their franchise superstar Kevin Garnett some help, as on top of acquiring Sprewell, they had also traded for point guard Sam Cassell from Milwaukee, as these three would combine to be the NBA's highest scoring trio, with Sprewell finishing as the team's third leading scorer. Sprewell would hit double figures in 64 games, including six games with at least 30 as the T-Wolves were led by their soon-to-be MVP in Garnett and would feature a top-10 scoring offense and defense, which would lead them to a 58-24 record and the top seed in the West, as round one of the playoffs brought the Denver Nuggets. And a very necessary side note is that it was around this time where Sprewell and Data announced the Supreme Spinners. After Sprewell had helped popularize spinning rims on an MTV Cribs episode a few years earlier, as he would wear these shoes during the playoffs. The first round would end in a gentleman's sweep for Minnesota, as Sprewell would average nearly 20 points for the series, on about 45% from the field and 56% from deep, while also averaging over a steal and a block per game, setting up a second round matchup versus the Sacramento Kings. Sprewell wouldn't be as efficient in this series, but he was still able to put up 19 points a game while averaging over 5 rebounds and nearly a steal and a block, and he had some big moments, such as Game 5 with the series tied 2-2 where he would drop a game-high 34 points on nearly 62% shooting in a win, then would follow that up with 27 points while going 6 of 7 from deep, albeit in a loss. And even though he had a poor Game 7, the Wolves would outlast the Kings to advance to their first conference finals in franchise history, where waiting for them were the LA Lakers. Sprewell would average nearly 21 points, 4 rebounds, 5 assists, and 1.5 steals for the series, but his efficiency was poor, and overall the T-Wolves fell behind 3 games to 1. Sprewell averaged 17.5 points over the first four games, but would put up 28 points on over 52% shooting in Game 5 to help Minnesota extend the series. But their season would come to an end in Game 6, as Sprewell would still drop 27 points in the loss. But for the regular season, Sprewell averaged about 17 points, 4 rebounds, and 3.5 assists per game. Going into 05, Sprewell was entering the final year of a contract which had been paying him an average of about $12 million per year, and the T-Wolves would offer the 34-year-old a 3-year $21 million extension, which he would decline, with his reason for declining infamously being that he had a family to feed, and the $21 million wouldn't be enough. So Sprewell would play the 05 season on an expiring contract, and would in turn have the least productive season of his career. He would fall out of the team's top 3 scorers, as 6th man Wally Zerbiak would have a better year. Additionally, the T-Wolves would take a step back as a whole, with Cassell missing 23 games and also seeing his production take a significant drop, as Minnesota would fall to a middle-of-the-pack offense, with Sprewell recording just 18 games with at least 20 points. And although the T-Wolves would finish with 14 less wins than last year, 
It was still a winning record, but 44 and 38 wouldn't be enough for a playoff berth in a competitive Western Conference, as Sprewell season ended with him averaging about 13 points, three rebounds, and two assists per game. But now he was a free agent going into the offseason, and it would turn out that 05 would be Sprewell's final NBA season. Reportedly, he had other offers for the 06 season, yet he and his agent would decline all of them, apparently betting on teams getting desperate around the trade deadline. But that didn't happen when his agent had made it clear that a now 35-year-old Sprewell wouldn't sign any deal for the mid-level exception. So that was it for the tumultuous career of Latrell Sprewell. Overall, it's pretty impressive that he made it to the NBA and had as much success as he did with how late of a start he got on organized basketball. He proved himself at Alabama as someone with extreme potential to be an elite two-way player. And he was on his way in Golden State as their one consistently improving player during a period filled with injuries and turnover. Maybe if they kept Weber, Sprewell's time in Golden State would have been different. Definitely if the Carlissimo incident happens, his time in Golden State is different. But even though it wasn't a great way to go about it, it was one of the best things that happened to his career, as Golden State was going nowhere fast, and he was too good to rot away on a bad team. So even though he tarnished his reputation, it got him moved to a city like New York, that embraced his toughness and fearlessness. And he rewarded them, as part of some of their most memorable teams. Then even by the end, he was part of a historic Timberwolves season. It's a shame how his career ended, but you can't say he didn't have a good run. He played angry and was one of the best slashers in the game. He had elite body control, and although it was streaky, his mid-range game was nice. And on top of that, he was a great offensive player who took his defense just as seriously. And as far as how Latrell Sprewell was on the court, he was a player every fan wanted to emulate. But that's it for today's episode on Spree. Hope you enjoyed it and make sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. If you liked it, check out this one on his New York running mate. Or this one on another Alabama alum. Thanks for watching and see you next time.